you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 2. And this is a familiar passage to many who's been in the church. It's been preached on by many a pastors and speakers, but it's a good one. And we're going to use that as a jumping off point this morning. And hopefully we see this picture of the church and we say, yes, Lord, that's, that's what we want. Um, and so before we do that, actually, I think we're going to read it and then jump right in. So I know I had you just sit down, but um, if you are willing and able, here at Vintage Church, we stand for the reading of God's Word. And so please stand if you're willing and you're able. We do this because we believe that the Word of God is powerful, that it's inspired by God, that it is for our encouragement, it is for exhortation, it's for our equipping. And um, by standing, it's just a small thing by saying, we want to hear from you this morning. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, through the scripture. And in Acts 2, 42, this is what the word of the Lord says. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word, and we do ask this morning for a spirit of wisdom and revelation to know Jesus better. So open the eyes of our hearts this morning, enlighten our hearts of understanding, give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you're speaking through your spirit and your scripture. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. If you take a note at that first verse, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. But the thing that I want you to think about is that they devoted themselves. And um, I don't know what you are devoted to, but um, I recently joined uh, a fantasy football league, and my um, nephew um, is the owner of the league, and I have, it's mainly family, a few of his friends, and uh, I've been doing it a few years, and, you know, sometimes I'll look at my phone, and on the fantasy app, it'll have like, you know, 50 messages. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? And I, I look at the chat, and it's just like all of this talk and research. And the first year I ever did fantasy, I was devoted. I, I don't know how much time I spent researching all of these players I had no clue about, but I wanted to win. I was devoted. And I, I see my, my nephew and my other nephew, and they're just always going back and forth, talking and talking. And what about this guy? Let's trade this guy. And I'm just like, and this year, honestly, it's like, We'll see. <laughs> you know, I, I do a little bit here and there, but uh, what are you devoted to? Um, well, it says here that the early church was devoted to the apostles' teaching, what we could just summarize as the gospel, right? Because most of the New Testament was written by the apostles or a representative of one of the apostles, capital A, apostles, one of the eyewitnesses of Jesus. And so we could say that the early church was devoted to the gospel. But the second thing it says that they were devoted to was the fellowship. And, you know, thinking about gospel partnership and thinking about what that means, really, as we'll learn later in the class today, um, this idea of partnership in the gospel comes from this word in the Greek, koinonia. You may have heard it. I know many um, organizations and nonprofits utilize that. It's this word koinonia that means fellowship. And, you know, I have this hunch that somewhere along the way we have missed out on what fellowship means. Because if I say, hey, we're going to fellowship today, mostly what that means in church circles is we're going to eat. Right? Now, I have no qualms or issues with eating. I think eating is awesome. 
especially when you're fasting, you're like, eating is awesome. I know after the prayer and worship night, I am going straight to the taco truck or in and out Tara wants sushi. So we're like already like thinking about food, right? Um, so, so eating is awesome, okay? But here's the deal. I, I think we cheapen the word fellowship if that's all it means to us. I mean, down the way, we have a what? A fellowship hall. And, you know, I said this before, but we could call that the koinonia hall because that's really where we get this word fellowship. And, you know, I guess I could get behind the idea of being devoted to eating together with friends and family or the church, but that's not what it means. And so my hope today in this sermon is really to ask the question, why gospel partnership? Because I think somewhere along the way, um, we have redefined fellowship in our minds. Maybe we know deep down that it's something more, but, but what if fellowship is something more than just eating and being with your friends and attending a social gathering and sprinkling, sprinkling a little Jesus on it? What if over time we've redefined the word and even cheapened it? What if because of hurt in churches or maybe compromise or convenience or even just pragmatism, what works, or bad theology, bad preaching? What if we've missed the mark on what fellowship is? And we've somewhere along the way redefined what fellowship is in the church when really what we look at in Acts 2.42 is that the early church devoted themselves, yes, to the gospel, but secondly, to the fellowship, and then the breaking of the bread and prayer. And even breaking of the bread, um, I, I, I believe it's a reference of communion. They gave themselves to sharing a meal at the table, um, breaking bread and sharing the cup. Why? Because it was the blood and body of Jesus that unified them. And then they gave themselves to prayer. And so this morning, I, I, I asked the question, what are you devoted to? Because when we start talking and unpacking this idea of gospel partnership today, it's recapturing, it's reimagining what it looks like to be devoted to to the apostles' teaching, yes, but also devoted to the fellowship. Because I believe that what the world needs more than anything is not more churches getting together in fellowship halls and having potlucks. And I'm all for church potlucks. I'm all for church potlucks. I still remember my dad was a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor. And um, I remember my dad, he planted a church in Plymouth, California. It's up the way. And, you know, I remember having potlucks every so often. And there was this one dish that Sister Jessie always made. And it was this dessert called Chocolate Delight. Oh my, I, I still have very, very, very fond memories of Sister Jessie's chocolate delight. I was all for, I'm all for potlucks. But, but what if fellowship is something so much more and the church is hurting and losing its witness in our world today, I believe, because somewhere along the way we've exchanged biblical fellowship for some cheap substitute. And, and really what... I believe the Lord would speak to us, and I think he's speaking at large in the church, is that the church is way more than just getting together and singing some songs and maybe learning some inspirational self-improvement message. It's something so much more. And that's why we are unpacking this idea of gospel partnership, because I hope that when we see what it is, that we would see that we are being compelled by and envisioning something so much grander and so much bigger. I don't know if you um, have watched The Chosen. Anyone watch The Chosen? It's, a, it's, it's good. It's, 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 they've done a lot of work to try to make it biblical and sound. Um, you know, they obviously take some liberty in some of the drama and behind the scene, but it's rooted in history and so far, I, I, I've enjoyed it. And, you know, there's this scene of Jesus in the first seri season of him calling disciples to himself. And they're forming this unit. And they're a bunch of oddballs, right? I mean, like, I love the scene where James and John is wanting to call down 
fire from heaven on the Samaritans because they are different and don't like each other. And Jesus talks to them, and he, he ends up saying to James and John, he goes, hey, guys, this is something so much bigger. I'm doing something here way bigger than you can even imagine. And if you guys could wrap your brains about what I'm trying to do, this stuff wouldn't matter. And then he kind of laughs and he goes, really? You wanted me to call down fire from heaven on them? Like, really? And he's like, makes a joke and he goes, oh, I'm going to call you guys the sons of thunder. And um, it's, it's beautiful. But, but what if we could imagine something bigger? What if we could be captivated and captured by a vision of the church that's so much bigger than just eating together, singing songs? I think if we were to do that, it would change everything. And that's really what we see here in Acts 2.42. And um, Acts 2.42 to 47, it's the summary. I think Luke details what the church ideally looked like and represented it on the front end after, the Pente after Pentecost, after the church was birthed and burst onto the scene as this powerful force in the world that was going to start in Jerusalem and then go to Judea and then to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth being Jesus's witnesses. And it captures kind of the, the ethos or the essence of what the church was meant to be. And the first thing that we see is not only did they devote themselves to good doctrine, but they devoted themselves to koinia, or the fellowship. Um, and so here at Vintage Church, we define gospel partnership as this. A shared stewardship in the grace of God, gospel, and mission of God. That, that's what we are defining um, gospel partnership. And again, the gospel partners class at 12 is going to go into this more. But this is what we define gospel partnership as, a shared stewardship. Now, um, ownership is not something that we can say we have at the church. Why? Because it's not ours. That's the first thing that we have to understand. That when we're talking about this idea of, of involvement or commitment or even devotion, that we're devoted to something that is not ours, but we are stewards of. That it ultimately belongs to God. And we'll see that a little bit more clear when we get to our, my second point this morning. But what we will see this morning is that the church belongs to God. It's his. And yet he entrusts us with it. And he, that's why we have this treasure in jars of clay. We are stewards of the grace of God. And if you were to read Paul, and if you were to read how he describes what it means to be a steward, a steward is something that manages someone, something for someone that it belongs to someone else. And so you're stewarding it. You're, you're taking care of it. And so we have been given the grace of God. We have been given the gospel of Jesus. We have been given this mission. And we are to steward it. And we are to do it together. And so that's how we are going to define gospel partnership. And so really, I only have two points today. And we're going to work through those. But the, the question this morning is, why gospel partnership? Why can't we just, you know, come to church and sing a couple songs and call it good? Why, why any type of organization? Or why any type of formal devotion? Why any type of commitment? Why anything like that? I think one will see from today that it is... One, gospel partnership or this idea of, of committing together for the mission of God, it's not new, number one. And then number two, simply gospel partnership is needed. And those are going to be the two points that we talk about this morning. So again, the question this morning is why gospel partnership? Number one, gospel partnership is not new. Now again, excuse me, Acts 2, 42 to 47, it's this beautiful summary and picture of the early church. And for, for I know some guys that when they read that, they're like, this is what the church needs to be. And they always feel bad or shame because the church is not that. Again, it's an ideal. It's something for us to imagine and aspire to. All you have to do is look at the book of Corinthians and look like that's not exactly what was going down in Acts 2.42, right? I mean, all of the letters that Paul is writing to these churches were to dysfunctional churches that were trying to get something right after they had totally messed something up. And so we have to see that this is the ideal. This is what we are shooting for. But again, context matters here. And so my hope this morning is to share some 
context, especially since we've been in Exodus, of how we get to Acts 2.42 to 47. Because Acts 2.42 to 47 is on the heels of Pentecost. And if, if, you're, if you've been in church for a while, you, you know that. But if you're newer to church or you don't understand the two, or maybe you've heard a sermon on Acts 2.42 about community, but you don't realize that it was on the heels of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, Pentecost happens. The Holy Spirit falls on 120 believers in a room. Now, a little bit more context. Jesus has already lived the life, this perfect, sinless, life, right? He's gone to the cross for our sins to stand in our place, to absorb the wrath of God. And then on the third day, he is raised victorious over sin, Satan, and death. And then he spends 40 days with his disciples, teaching them about the kingdom. And then he ascends into heaven. And he says that I will come again in this same matter, but I want you to wait in Jerusalem for I am going to send the Holy Spirit and he will empower you to be my witnesses to, the, to starting in Jerusalem, then to Judea, then to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so the um, early church, these group of 120 people, are gathering in an upper room, and they are waiting, and they are praying. And then on Pentecost, 50 days after Easter Sunday, the Holy Spirit descends, and it says that they were all in one place with one accord. And then the Holy Spirit comes, and it, it, a mighty rushing wind happens. And then there's these, looks like kind of flames of these tongues of flaming fires appears over each believer's head, and then they all speak in different languages. And then the um, Luke, who was a doctor and a physician who's writing a detailed account for this man named Theophilus, he makes very intentional effort to write out all these different nations that Jews were at, because at the Feast of Weeks, which was the Feast of Pentecost, all of these Jews would gather in Jerusalem. And he goes on to say there that all of these Jews from various different nations were all gathered, and it says something pretty remarkable, that they were hearing the praise of God in their own language. So whether that was a supernatural gift of interpretation or they were all speaking in languages, we don't really know. But what we do know is that something marvelous was happening and that the gospel was going out to the nations and the church was born. This is the context of Acts 2, 42 to 47. Now, remember that the Old Testament and Jesus himself had told the church to wait and it was going to be in Jerusalem that the Holy Spirit would empower them to be a witness to the nations. Now, that's very important, okay? Because, again, we're trying to see the fulfillment happening here in Pentecost. All right, this is truly the birth story of the church. And it's important that we see that it isn't just pulled out of anywhere. It's not just something new that bursts on the scene. But this was a fulfillment of so much things that we've even been looking at in Exodus, even in Genesis. And so hopefully, as, as if you're familiar with the passage in Acts chapter 2, you, you start to hear hyperlinks of the Genesis story or even the Exodus story because there's a lot of stuff going on in um, Acts chapter 2 that we have to pay attention to to understand the fullness of what is happening and how that pours out into this rich community that we call the church. All right, so as we've been going through Exodus, or if you've studied Genesis, you, you, hopefully you hear this. But the first thing that we have to see, that the Feast of Pentecost, as I mentioned, was 50 days after Easter Sunday. But also, in Orthodox rabbinic traditions, Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, marks the revelation of the Torah to Moses and the Israelites at Mount Sinai. So you've got to see the imagery here, all right? The Jewish people saw Pentecost as a celebration of Moses receiving the law. Okay? So what else happened when Moses received the law? There was a mighty wind. There was fire on the mountain. So right there you start making sense of, okay, there's some imagery happening here. What happened when God filled the tabernacle or he filled the temple with his glory? There was fire. There was a mighty wind. So what you see in Acts chapter 2 is that the presence of God, the temple presence of God, began to dwell with man. It was a new Sinai. 
All right? It was a new sign. It was a greater revelation. It was a greater um, giving of not the law, but of the gospel. It was a fullness of all the promises that God had promised in the Old Testament. It's so much more um, than just simply speaking in tongues. Pentecost is a giant, momentous occasion in redemptive history. This was what the fulfillment of ages was on. This is where the mystery of the ages, that Christ in us, the hope of glory, as Paul would write to the Colossians in chapter 1, verse 27, that this was the mystery of the ages that is now revealed to the saints, Christ in the church, the hope of glory. This is what the Holy Spirit descending is. It's God dwelling with man. It's a greater Sinai experience, and we see the language there. But there is also another story that Luke is giving careful attention to in this story of Pentecost, and that is the story of the Tower of Babel. Because you see, there was another place in the Bible where... This idea of being all in one accord or in one place. And if you're familiar with the story of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, the people were in one place as one body with one language. And it says that if God, it says if they could set their mind to anything, they could accomplish anything. And yet they weren't working for the name of God or the name of Jesus, right? They were working for their own name, for their own glory. And what does God do in that story? He distributes and he divides them and he disperses them. And it's there that we see that languages are um, dispersed and divided and everyone is now speaking different languages and they are dispersed all over the earth. There's a lot of stuff going on there, but this table of nations in Genesis chapter 10 is basically echoed and picked up by Luke in Acts chapter 2. It's very intentional what God is doing with the Feast of Pentecost. He is reversing Babel right? It, it was in that place where the nations were lost and Israel became the treasured possession of Yahweh, that it would be Israel that the nations would know who God is. Well, now it is fulfilled. And this is why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So therefore go make disciples of all, what? All nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what's happening in Acts chapter 2 is God God is reversing Babel. He's saying, I want a people who will gather together, united under one place with one language, and they will reach all the nations of the earth with the praises of God, with the gospel of Jesus. And I will empower them, and I will see them become this what cannot be done by a people who is united? And think back to what we read in Psalm 133, that where is the blessing of the Lord? Where is the anointing when brothers dwell together in unity? So what we see is in uh, Pentecost is a picture of the church, these 120 believers unified around one name, Jesus. And when the Spirit falls, Babel is reversed. Sinai is fulfilled in the sense that not the letter, but the Spirit is given. Is given. And then Paul later would say, this is why the letter kills and the Spirit gives life. Because this interesting fact, we'll get there when we get to the end of Exodus. At the end, when the tabernacle is built and the Holy Spirit or God's glory falls on the tabernacle, do you know what it says? It says that Moses could not enter into the tabernacle. Interesting story. All of this work, and yet Moses cannot enter into the tabernacle. At the end of the Exodus narrative, you know what happens to Moses? He doesn't get to go into the promised land. Why? Because of one infraction. Right? The law, as we talked about last week, is crushing. But the fulfillment of the gospel is that God has given us grace and by Jesus, and as he has ascended into heaven, and he has taken his rightful place as the king of glory, he has poured out his Holy Spirit to be the body of Christ on the earth. Uh, We are his hands and feet so that we can truly make 
his name great in all the earth and in a sense reach the nations that have been lost to him. And this is why churches, perhaps you are familiar with this, are constantly trying to get the gospel out to every tribe and every tongue because the picture in Revelation is that the church will be an assembled, diverse group of people from every tribe and every tongue. Why? Because God is at work through the church to reach the nations for the glory of God. There's something grand going on at Pentecost. And what happens is, is the fellowship, the church becomes the vehicle for this grand mission to come to pass. It is through the church that the gospel is advanced. It is through the church and this fellowship, this koinonia, that the nations will know. The nations will know. God and be brought back to him. Something so much bigger is happening. And one more interesting detail in the uh, Acts chapter 2 account of Pentecost, if you recall, again, we haven't gotten there in Exodus, but many of you are familiar probably with the golden calf where Moses was up on the mountain and the people of um, Israel broke the covenant, right? They were being formed as a covenant community at the base of Mount Sinai through the law. And then as Moses is up receiving more revelation from God, what happens? They get impatient and bored. And so they form a golden calf and they call it Yahweh. And they say, this has brought us out of Egypt. And God's like, you better get down there quick, boy, before I destroy all of them. And he's like, all right, we'll get there. <laughs> but he's like, I'm out. And he's like, basically, priest, let's go. And... 3,000 people die that day. 3,000 people die that day because of their idolatry. The law kills. But how many people received the word and were baptized at Pentecost? 3,000. You see, not only is it a reversal of Babel, it's a reversal of the covenant of the law. Or a fulfillment of it. Why? Because the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Something completely new is bursting on the scene at Pentecost. It's something so cosmic. It's something so grand. It's God's promises. And this is why you've heard me joke here or there where I say, you know, if someone asks you, um, is this, are, are we living in the last days? I say, well, we've been living in the last days since Pentecost. Something ginormous happened at Pentecost. It, it, it began where the spirit of the living God was dwelling with men. This is the mystery of the ages. Something grand is happening. And all of that, why do I share all of that? Because when we get to Acts 2, 42 to 47, something supernatural was happening. Something cosmic was happening. And the church would be the embodiment of that. Truly, when we say that we have this treasure in jars of clay, this is what we're talking about, that, that, that we have this gospel, this, this mysterious message that the, the creator of the universe would somehow dwell with sinful man because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And that in his perfect life and his substitutionary death and his victorious resurrection, somehow because of what he has done, now the spirit of the holy living God the one who spoke, and at 93 million, I think it's 93 million miles per second or something, I'm, I might have butchered that, but the speed of light spoke and light just come out of his mouth, and all the universe were created. This God lives in the church. We are the body of Christ his hands and feet to reach the nations for God. We have been given, yes, the grace of God, because this is all by the grace of God. We have been given the gospel, and we have been given the mission to be his witnesses. And recall, um, in Exodus chapter 19, he says, I have brought you by eagle's wings, and I have made you my treasured possession, and you are to be a kingdom of priests. And we looked at this earlier, but in 1 Peter, we pick up that story, the church. So the church definitely is much more than just potlucks and singing. 
God has, in his sovereign wisdom, decided to use the church to reach the nations with the gospel, to bring them back to him. And it started at Pentecost. You know, if you look at the Exodus story, you see the story of redemption and this story of rescue. And then what does God do at the base of Sinai? He forms a people through the covenant of the law. But what does God do through the rescue and redemption of Christ and the gospel? It's not like he just saves us so that we can go to heaven. No, he saves us so that we would be a, in a sense, new covenant community partnering together for the gospel with the mission to reach the nations. That's the ambition. In Exodus, the Sinai covenant bound together all Israelites into what is ideally a grand fellowship of mutual obligation and concern. And in Acts, what we see is that the Spirit, because of the new covenant in the body and blood of Christ, baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, the church, a grand fellowship of mutual obligation and concern. If you are a Christian this morning, when you were born again or when you were regenerated, you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. What that means is when you became a Christian, you were baptized or immersed into the body of Christ. You are part of this universal church, this grand fellowship. And we are to be mindful of that because God is forming a people for himself, a treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, or in Luke's language, witnesses to the ends of the earth. We are the people of God, marked with his presence, commissioned for his purpose, a covenant community, a fellowship that will bring back the nations to God. Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth now, and he has commanded that we make disciples of all nations, and this will be done through the church of Jesus Christ, through a gospel community on mission. Now, in our model of gospel partnership, we use kind of three things, and all three of these words, partakers, um, partners, and participants, all in the book of Philippians are the same word koinia in the Greek. This is a representation of the fellowship that is described in Acts 2.42, but the interesting thing is, is these three things are picked up in the Exodus story as well. For example, I, I mentioned this, but, but we're, the, the Israelites were partakers of grace. Sometimes we think, oh, in the Old Testament, it's all law. No, I've tried to explain this through our sermons, that, that it says that on eagles' wings, God rescued the people of God and brought them to Sinai. That's grace. They didn't deserve to be rescued out of Egypt. They didn't deserve to, for God to show up and show off in the ten plagues. They didn't deserve being provided for in the wilderness. They had not received the law yet. It was the grace of God that brought them to the formation of them being a covenant community. And also, partners in giving. In Exodus 25, I'm going to go there. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me, or it's going to be on the screen. I got a few scriptures that we're going to pop around to um, as we wind down the, the plane, but um, in Exodus chapter 25, he's talking about the tabernacle and building the tabernacle, and listen to what he says in verse 2. Speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution from every man whose heart moves him. You shall receive the contribution from me. So even in the Old Testament, there was an idea that all the people contributed to the tabernacle or to the place where God's presence would dwell and where worship would be offered. And it was a free will offering. It was as a man's heart moves him, he should contribute to the work of building the tabernacle. And so when we see in the New Testament where we see this idea of partnership and giving for the gospel and, and, and being the church in local um, context, what we see is that we are, that God loves a cheerful giver, right? That we are to give out of, um, not compulsion, but we are to give freely because we want to see the mission and the gospel move forward. And this is what it means to partner in the gospel, to partner in what God is doing in the local church. And then 
lastly, it says participation in gifts. And what we see in Exodus chapter 35, when all of the instructions for the tabernacle begin to be executed and actually been, be put into practice and, and built, constructed, um, it says that God gives unique people special gifts and um, actually fills them with the Holy Spirit so that they could be expert craftsmen. I mean, listen to what it says. It says, this is in Exodus 35. He goes, Every skillful craftsman among you, come and make all that the Lord has commanded. And we even see of Bezalel, the son of Uri, the God had filled him with the Spirit of God. It says, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood for work in every skilled craft. And it says he inspired him to teach even. So even in the Exodus account, which is this model, this Old Testament model of our redemptive, redemptive story or the church, we see that God was giving men and women gifts to help construct the tabernacle. And what do we see in the um, book of Corinthians or the New Testament? That the Holy Spirit gives the church gifted people. Why? So that they can build the body of Christ up. It actually says in Peter that we are living stones. In some sense, we are the tabernacle. We are the body of Christ. We are the temple of the living God. And he gives gifts to men and women so that we would build up the church. And so what we see, start seeing in scripture, hopefully, is that we are all partakers of grace. We become partnership partners in giving and then we participate in the spirit through his gifts and building up the church and it looks different and then why do we do this in the exodus story it was all for the glory of god it was all for the common good and it was for a witness to the nations right we see that at the end when the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle. And why do we want to be a spirit-filled, gospel-centered, missional church? Because that's the goal. So what do we do? We, we partake in his grace. We become partners in giving. And we participate with our spiritual gifts that God has given us. Why? For the ultimate glory of God and for the common good. And that we would be witnesses to the nations. You see, this is why we define gospel partnership here at Vintage as a shared stewardship of the grace of God, the gospel, and the mission of God. Because we have been given this as, as, as a treasure in jars of clay. Will we, will we be perfect? No. <laughs> but if we would clothe ourselves with humility, and if we would be, in a sense, living out this gospel wonder that who are we that we would be given the mystery of the ages, Christ in us, the hope of glory? And that's why Colossians 1.28 says, Him we proclaim, teaching and admonishing all with all wisdom. And it's with His energy we struggle so that everyone is found mature and complete, not lacking anything. This is the great ambition of the church. This is why it's a shared stewardship. It's not ours. It's not ours. And, and finally, and this one's much shorter. Secondly, this is why I only have two points. Secondly, why gospel partnership? Because we need it. Because we need it. Um, there's a verse in Hebrews. If you can sh pop that up on the screen. It says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So I, this is more at first about me. As a pastor, as an under-shepherd in the church, I take it very seriously, my calling and commission to do that. And right here, do you know what it says? That one day, I will have to stand before the Almighty God and give an account for those that were under my care and how I taught them and how I shepherded them and how I cared for them. And it actually says in James, and not all of you should be teachers. Why? Because there will be what? A more severe judgment for those who teach the Word of God. I believe the Word of God with all my heart, and so I take this very seriously. So then the next question is what? Well, then who's my sheep? Well, or who, better question, who are the sheep 
God's sheep that he has put under my care as an under shepherd. But am I responsible for all the Christians in Lodi? Am I responsible for everyone that walks through those doors? Now, should I be kind and constantly want to be a witness in our city? Absolutely. But who will I give an account for? Who will I, as the what as one, hopefully one day we have more pastors and more elders, but, but w as the pastor now of this church, who will I give account for? And what Gospel Partnership does is it identifies those who would call this church their home church. That they would, they would identify and say, I'm in the flock. Now, does that mean if you're not a Gospel Partner, you're, you can't come or I don't care for you? No, not at all. It just means that I'm going to give, I'm going to say, okay, you're, you're here, you're going to partner with us, and we have this shared stewardship. So that means that we are going, one, on a really practical level, it, it means you can vote in our bylaws. If you're a Gospel Partner, you can vote. So since you have a shared stewardship of what God is doing here at this local location, you can vote, which means how we spend our dollars, um, uh, leadership decisions, all these types of things. That, that's on a practical way. But, but really, for me, like we need gospel partnership because I don't want to stand before God and God go, what about that one? And I go, I didn't even know they were a part of our church. And then on your side, for those that are non-leaders, look at what it says. It says, obey your leaders. So who's your leader? Is it, you know, Glenn at First Baptist? Is it the pastor down the street at Calvary? Like, who's your leader? Do you have to listen and obey this command to every single Christian pastor? No. It's a local context. Your leaders. Because you know them. And you see that in Paul's writings when he was in Philippi or these other New Testament areas that he says, you know my life. You see me. And so therefore you can trust your leadership. And that's why you should have qualified leaders in the church. Because in order for us to obey, and, and, and just to, so you can get this even more, when in Ephesians it says, husbands, lay down your life for your wife. I don't need to lay down my life for every woman. But I can lay down my life for my wife. Right? And then it says, wives, submit to your husband. Women, you don't need to submit to every man or respect every man. You should respect everyone because it's, what you know, kind. But do you understand what my point here? Like, it's your husband. You picked him. You stood before God and you exchanged vows and, and you made a promise. It's your husband. You should, if, if you don't like your husband, you should have thought about that before. You know, I'm just kidding. But, you, 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 but, but it's your husband. Do, do you get? And so, so when you say, I'm a gospel partner, you're like, I know my leader. I know what we believe in. I know where we're going. And so therefore, I'm here. Right? And then when you say that, as the leader, I can go, okay, you're my... You're in, my, you're in the flock. Great. I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to care for you. It doesn't matter. I pray for everyone. Of course, I pray for everyone. But again, it's a sense of we're here together, and we're building the church. It's needed. And lastly, um, I'm really just stalling because my daughter has to go get the chicken. Just kidding. Because we're having... <laughs> just kidding. No. No. Um, but in Acts chapter 20, and this is where we honestly are going to close, but in Acts chapter 20, Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders. And for me, as, as a pastor elder, this is, in, this is gold, and this is sobering, and this is something that if you ever aspire to be a leader in the church, a pastor, you should like spend a lot of time in, this, in these couple verses. But in verse chapter 24, this is chapter 20, verse 24, it says this. He says, I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I love Paul's heart. He's like, my life means nothing to me unless I finish what God has asked me to do. And then he says here, and now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. So what did Paul say? He's like, there's no blood on these hands. I knew 
who the church was in Ephesus, and I proclaimed the whole gospel to you. I gave you everything. And so now that I'm leaving to not see you again, I'm going to go get my head chopped off in Rome. I know that my conscience is clear. There's no blood on my hands, and I can stand confidently before the throne of God and give an account for how I have led here. And then it says this in verse 27, or verse 28, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Not every single person in every Christian in every single city, but pay attention to the flock, what? In which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. What does Paul say? He's like, Ephesian elders, God has made you overseers of this church. Not every church, this church. And the Holy Spirit has called you to this church. And here's the thing. So pay careful attention to yourselves and to this flock in Ephesus because wolves are coming and I want you to protect them. But look at what it says even more than that. He says to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Why is gospel partnership a weighty thing because we're not talking about a social club we're not talking about just eating together and singing songs we're talking about the body of Christ the place where God's spirit dwells where he has decided to put his glory we're talking about the place where the mission of God of reconciling the nations to himself is happening and we're, we're saying, beyond all of that, here, here's the real weight. The church that he obtained with his own blood. You matter. The church matters. No matter how broken, no matter how dysfunctional at times she can be, the true church matters because it was purchased by the blood of Christ. And the leadership of the church needs to know that. And those that belong to a local church need to feel that because it is weighty things that we do in the church. Now, as we prepare for communion, we practice open communion at Vintage Church. And what that means is that... Um, any Christian can come to the table and take up the cup and take the bread and, and partake. The table is to be a centerpiece. It's, it's where we, we find unity in our common confession of Jesus as Lord. And there are churches that do not allow um, non-members to partake communion. We are not that church. We believe that if you are a Christian, if you have been born again, if you have confessed Jesus as Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are a Christian and you are part of the body of Christ. And you are welcome to come. All right? But we should take this seriously because this is the family meal. This is the family table. And I say that because some may go, well, if I'm, you know, if I'm not a gospel partner, can I still come? Yes. Can you bring non-Christians? Yes. If you're, a, if you're not a Christian here this morning, are you welcome? Yes, always welcome. We will always be the church inviting others to come and invite others to the table. And if you're not a Christian this morning and, and you're like, you know what? I believe. It. I, I, I do confess Jesus as Lord. I do believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Then you know what it says? You're saved. And then you're welcome. To come to the table and to pick up the cup and to take up the bread and to give thanks that God has made us one in Jesus and he's brought you into this grand story that he's been writing from the beginning of time. You're always welcome here. And, and if you, you know, you're like, I'm a Christian, but I don't want to belong to a Christ. Are you still, or to a church? Are you still welcome here? Yes. 
But I would encourage you to belong to a church. If it's not this church, then find a good gospel preaching church that, that, that wants true community and belong to that church. Why? Because one, it's good and right for your soul, but it's also one biblical. And you're like, but I've been hurt by the church. And I know that, and we did a whole series on this. Okay? I know that there has been some severe hurt and trauma because of churches, but there's still much beauty in the church. It's still God's plan A, and there is no plan B. So I pray that church, as you hear this, and we talk about it more in our gospel class, I pray that everyone here would find a space to, to wrestle with God, to grow close to God. And I hope that for you, that if you're not a Christian, that we would be an aroma of Christ, that we would make Jesus irresistible. And yes, we will make mistakes. I will make mistakes. There's a spectrum of maturity here. But I pray that we will all clothe ourselves with humility, that we will live in gospel wonder, and we will share together this stewardship that we have been given of the mystery of the ages, this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray.